Hi, this is John Reed, live from Sage Transform 2024. I have a returning champion, Joni Girardi of Data Self. How are you doing? Awesome. You call it data geek or data hero. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, we, we go way back now. I remember interviewing you at a Tableau show in, in the middle of a hectic Dunkin' Donuts, and that was a long yes. time ago. We had a little less gray hair at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but the passion for data continues, Joni, and, Even and more, the yeah. problems for data in the era of AI and all the AI announcements we heard this week, really bring the data question to a head. And here's how you get on my podcast multiple times. You make a difference for customers, especially around things like data and BI. And that's really been a huge theme with data self in your work is understanding the finance user, the business user, what they need out of AI. Uh, just for a little bit of background, Joni has spent a lot of time with cloud ERP vendors in particular, but helping business users pull data into meaningful frameworks, which include all the custom stuff you built for, you know, stuff like Tableau and Power BI, right? But it really comes down to what finance users really need to make better decisions, get results, and all the obstacles in the way of that, right? Isn't that kind of your... Absolutely. ...how you live? So you've got a lot of stories to tell, and we're going to get a mid-market analytics reality check from you today. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> what, what is your mid-market analytics reality check? Yeah, no, I've, as you mentioned, I've been uh, focusing this problem of helping decision makers make more informed decisions for 20 plus years. And from the beginning, my, my, my focus is mid-market, you know, large companies, they have large budget, they can do it. Mid-sized companies, they have the need, but they usually don't have the sophistication, their IT and, and support to take care of the BI problem. And, and to me, uh, one of the things that fascinates me and sometimes frustrates me is so many of them would see great value from BI, from business intelligence as a whole, but many of them, they continue to use what we call the clunky tools, good tools, but you know, they're not empowering decision makers. And part of the problem to me is because these companies, mid-sized companies, uh, they became extremely successful in their own specialty, you know, building parts, uh, selling their services. They're really not techies. They are, they're not uh, computer savvy people. They are building solutions. And when we come as a data geek, as a geek to uh, offer uh, amazing technology, sometimes we forget that they are very unsophisticated from an IT standpoint because you're really amazing at something else that is not technology. Mm -hmm. And if we don't go to step one and take them to step two and three and four, you try to take them from step one to 10 in a single jump and they miss a lot of the benefits. So to me, one of the biggest challenges of BI is not technology, is understanding where people are as a starting point and help them go from you know, crawling, walking, running, and, f and flying. And it's a simple idea, but in real life, it's very challenging to get this business to go through all of these steps. And that makes you a really good fit with Sage Intact the way I see it, because a big focus of Sage and Intact in particular is the finance user. And, you know, I've talked with some customers this week about trying to achieve sort of what you might call a single source of truth. But once you have that from a transactional basis, you still want to now make better decisions, right? You want to arm your users and in particular your division managers, things like that, people out in the field with better information. Right. And this is what you try to do, right? Right. Insights. Yeah. Right. Insights. And, and one thing, if you look at Intact in all of these, uh, we call the OLTP systems, systems where the focus is to get data in mm -hmm. and help the staff get their jobs. That's really the focus of ERP, right? This automating and helping the staff got their job. Right. Uh, all of these tools, and Intact has an amazing set of you know, reporting tools, but they are focused on their problem, helping the staff getting their job done. But as a manager, as a decision maker, higher level, you don't wanna see the microscope data. You wanna see the big numbers, the, the telescope, right? You know, we wanna see the big numbers, the revenues, the, the costs, and, and then once you see an outlier, you want to be able to quickly slice and dice and see the why that's happening. In that kind of telescope view, being able to go from the telescope to the binocular to the, to the microscope is a BI problem. Mm -hmm. It's not an ERP reporting problem. And, and that's one of the friction that we have sometimes is, is how to educate the ERP channel and the ERP users 
that uh, the intact reporting is really amazing at certain part of the problem. And if you're hitting some of the limitations, don't try to continue to use that. You know, go for the BI where you really can give management what they're looking for, which is telescope ability to go to the microscope as needed. Right. Absolutely. And I want to get into some of the AI stuff. And, I, and you and I did, did an exchange full notes on this, so I don't know exactly what all your opinions are, so this should be fun. But before we, I want to build up to the AI because obviously... In particular, Aaron Harris in his keynote had a lot to say about that. But, um, but tell me more about just in general where we are with with sort of helping business users along this BI journey. One thing that I was struck by that you mentioned to me before was this issue of the 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 the, the data geeks you refer to want to automate things. Mm -hmm. But the business user, maybe does, it's not as intuitive to them. I didn't quite understand yep. what you were getting out there. So maybe yep. you can elaborate on that. Sure. Um, if you look successful people, they're really good at something, whatever the something is, right? You're not good at multiple things. Usually you're really good at something, you know, like, you know, if you're selling or if you're building parts or if you're renting uh, 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 whatever that, you know, your, your, your units. And, and these business people, uh, they're usually managing a bunch of people and technology is usually a means to an end. You know, it's not the main focus of them technology. Mm. The main focus is building, selling, whatever they're doing, managing. <clears throat> Myself as a data geek, you know, because I live in breathe technology, I have in my brain, like, you know, multiple threads. And I think I have a few that is always thinking from a technology standpoint in my life, how can I use computers to make more productive? So mentally, because I'm a data geek, if I go to a tool and I kind of learn how to use, I'm thinking, can I use it better? Because I'm a technology person. But most business people, they're not technology people. They, they, they usually look at technology as a, uh, like, you know, is a tool, but I have to learn the tool. I have to be expanding the tool and they're too busy. So to me, one of the limitations that I see uh, in my own journey with BI is, uh, is, is we assuming that they're learning how valuable AI, uh, uh, BI can be in not understanding how beginners they are on the journey and how we take them from, again, crawling, walking, running, flying. And if you mm -hmm. try to jump one of these steps, you lose them. You know, I have an example where I was telling you before, uh, in, in BI, even many other tools, it's very easy nowadays to, if you have a report that you're consuming in a certain format, if you want to receive automatic in the schedule, most tools today have a button that is usually easy to find that you say, subscribe to this, to this report, send me every day at 1 a.m. And, and copy Mary and Joe. It's usually something simple. And so many times we get clients that they call us, we're doing like you know, a project review, and usually people, can we get these reports by schedule? And we have, already have shown multiple times. And, and why people are not listening is because people are busy, and until they're ready to listen to that particular pain point, you know, they don't, they don't get it. And you said, just to add to the list of the problems and challenges, you also told me something also surprised me a little bit that self-service BI, which has been around for 10 years, right. really hasn't lived up to its potential. Why is that? I think it goes back to the same problem that um, when we uh, onboard our clients in showing how data, you know, how BI works, uh, they get only a piece of the problem. And once they get something that is working for them, they stick to that problem. And until they are ready to ask for something else, they're just working with a few features. You know, the whole thing of people use 20% of the, the availability of the software. I think it's the same problem with BI. And in so many times when, you know, lately at the company, we created an initiative to do our customer success management, meaning let's go back to clients. Let me bring, you know, my, my top data geeks and just see where people are, what struggles they still have. In, in some of these clients, they have been using data cell for quite a while. They went through the, 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 the regular training, all the pieces. And so many times there are simple things that were covered in the past and they're still struggling. And in a way, to me, is, is educational. How can we come up with a, a process that we can see more quickly training issues? And sometimes it's just turnover, like people, you know, change people and the new people, they learn, but they actually, they didn't, is, is a people problem. It's not a technology problem. Yes. And this is something that has jumped out to me a lot is that 
while there's still a lot of technical maturity that needs to happen around certain elements of BI, like certain predictive BI and certain kinds of advanced AI, and maybe improving some of the interfaces with AI, like in general, the technology is really good these days. It's not old clunky BI tech of old, but it tends to put the spotlight back on the people and the process issues around, am I making better decisions with, with information? Right. So what, what, kinds of, what kinds of problems are you helping finance users solve with, with data now? Well, um, I think that the, the problems have been the same for, for quite a while. Um, um, nowadays, business is more complicated than in the past. Uh, there's a lot more data. You know, in the past, if I were to go 20 years ago, uh, to run data self, let's say internally, we had, you know, three, four digital systems that we could do the whole business. Nowadays, we have more than 30 systems that we, we, we use regularly to just run the business. Mm. And every system has a piece of our business, right? Uh, so the complexity of uh, understanding what is happening in your, in your business is usually spread out in multiple systems. And, and from a BI standpoint, from a reporting standpoint, each one of them, they have their own reports. But as a, a decision maker, what you want to see is the data t- together. So the value of, of, of bringing the data together in a BI solution has been there for a while, but most companies, uh, when we tell them that the value of a BI, one of the, the long run is to consolidate all of your data together, because at the end of the day, if the customer goes to your social media, goes to your ERP, CRM, go to your ERP, is the same client interfacing with different digital systems. Mm-hmm. Why the data separate? Right. Well, right now it is it is, but you know, the, the, the data warehouse in BI is where the solution really can, can reside. The vision is simple. The execution, it takes a while. Right. But the power of having all that data in one place. It's amazing. It is big. Yeah. It, just to give an example, there was even from our own uh, use of, you know, we use data self internally for our own uh, reporting. Uh, we use HubSpot as our ERP, uh, CRM. Many years ago, we were just using uh, HubSpot for, you know, CRM purposes, emailing and checking uh, how many clicks and how many opens, which was the focus of, of uh, the CRM. And then uh, one day I decided, hey, let me see how our CRM will look in data self. So I was a, was a long holiday and I had nothing to do. So I, I built the, the integration. And one of the things that was fascinating was uh, when I was able to see the data across multiple email campaigns, it t- t- before we could see one email campaign at a time and see what was happening, open and clicks, mm. should we send earlier, should we send later, it was a marketing discussion. But when I was able to see all the campaigns and which companies and people were clicking on, the, on, the, on our content, um, I saw one of the prospects we were talking with, and I had two people that were clicking our content that I had no clue who they were. Like, oh, who are these people? So I went back to my emails and they were copied in several of the discussions. They were part of some calls. I went to LinkedIn and then I found one of them was a key decision maker. So I emailed the person asking, hey, you know, I know that you're part of the process. I didn't tell that I saw this, this, mm-hmm. this trend, right? Consuming your content. Hey, I know that you're part of the process. What's your role in the process? What you, what you're thinking? Anyhow, because I was able to see this data that was hidden before, was completely not in the radar, I started a conversation with this person and he was a key decision maker that eventually closed the deal. Mm. So the ability to give decision makers visibility into things that only they can see there is value is something that only BI really has the power. And many companies still are not understanding how to properly get a BI solution to give them the power that they need to make more informed decisions. And the advantage of working with, uh, partnering with an intact type provider is that at least you're some of the way there. Like you may have other systems in some cases, a CRM or whatever, but at least you've done some heavy lifting around financial integration because in the past, a lot of intact customers were running maybe on multiple versions of QuickBooks or, you know, Excel spreadsheet hell or whatever. And now they have a bit of a leg up, right? So at least they can kind of get started on some things. And this is part of the value of data self. Um, right. If you know, when I do my, my, my presentations like, like yesterday, uh, if a company decides to, to realize that BI is the answer to solve this problem, primarily if they have intact or other systems we support, 
Uh, the old school way, which is most people still do, is start from scratch. Pick the BI tool that you want to work with. You usually have to hire some data geeks that know Intact and other sources and start to build a model. And eventually, in the course of months, year, you'll be able to get it all done. If you're lucky enough to keep them, retain them, good luck, because nowadays it's hard to retain good yeah. people. It's a successful project. The data cell vision is pretty much because we have been doing this for 20 years for multiple ERP systems, incl including Intact. What we do in one day usually would take about a year of two, three people to build from scratch. So you can start a BI project uh, from scratch in pretty much one day, you get 80% of what, what you have to develop from scratch, you, you get in day one. You still have 20% to, to customize, but we dramatically accelerate the journey on a BI project because we already have the mappings to the intact uh, AR, AP, GL, uh, contracts and, and, and accelerate the value of BI. What I thought was interesting too, yesterday talking with some customers, one in particular, a construction industry customer I'm going to be writing about, but I really enjoy talking about what happens when the light bulbs start to come off after the initial go live and, and, and lead, uh, the leaders start figuring out what they can do with the power of that data in their systems. Mm -hmm. And the example yesterday that I was drilling into a bit was profitability and how mm -hmm. what they were finding much to their surprise was that what some of the clients and products they thought were most profitable mm. actually were not once they were really able to take all the numbers into account, right? Right. And then in other cases, some of the shorter engagements that they didn't think were having as much impact actually from a profitability perspective were much more profitable. So now it's like, let's double down on that. Right. And that might sound simple, but that's a big business adjustment for them that was only possible because they had at least started to take that step of getting, you know, into a structured platform, in this case, intact. Yeah. But then the light bulb starts to go off of what you can do with that, right? And right. to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, that's why I'd want to be in this business that you have put your so much of your life into is is those light bulb moments. And how do you yep. get to those moments is, is really the key, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. In, in a, a little bit of what you're saying, you know, credit to Intact, absolutely, because they have an amazing platform, as well as the channel, the VARs, that implement Intact. Uh, what I've seen over, over time is that um, when you embrace a modern ERP like Intact, part of the, the project is not only getting out of your, I don't know, QuickBooks, whatever it is, into a better system, but there's also usually reprocessing, change your processes, in part of this, this, this evolution is if you get the right uh, intact VAR, you're going to discuss in where you are today, where you want to go, and how technology can be changed to help better processes. Yep. And, and when you do this, you get better, you're capturing your data in a better way. And that will pr allow companies to realize, oh my God, you know, I thought that this big customer was the right one and we're losing money p potentially. We have many situations where clients, they were thinking they were focused on the right, you know, people and it actually was not profitable. While right. some smaller ones, they were not so yeah. important. They were actually the, the good ones. So yeah, the data can show you realities that only the data can show you. Now let's get into, you've kind of laid out the problems and some of the payoffs. Let's get into how AI can impact this in some different ways. Obviously, AI is a complicated subject because we could talk about AI in terms of things like predictive technologies, which have been around for a while uh, in, in, the, in the BI space. Then you could talk about the increasing role that AI could potentially play around data cleansing and data quality. Um, and then there's also generative AI now. And to me, that holds some interest in terms of some of the ways that that users could potentially get some of your points around adoption that right. that some of these interfaces can be very appealing to work with and perhaps a little more friendly than the past sort of right uh, so maybe that is another way of engaging business users but anyway so but there's also a lot of hype right um, i really enjoy in particular hearing aaron harris talk about these things because i think he's one of the more articulate you know, executives in our industry yeah. in terms of the ground. Yeah. these changes but yeah. let's just kind of open it up like what did you make of what you heard this week and and let's start drilling into that a little yeah. bit yeah well AI you know you can go in so many directions as you mentioned uh, to me 
And I was also hearing um, Aaron Harris, um, some of his podcasts recently. Uh, if you were able to fast forward, you know, I don't know, how many years, five, 10, 15, whatever, when eventually AI is delivering what the hype is today, uh, primarily when you're gonna go as a user to a computer, you're gonna have a prompt, what you wanna do, and you type in English, and then the tool will just figure out where to go, what to do, and just execute it. This is gonna happen. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know that, that uh, AI will, will grow to a point where the user interface of today usually is multiple pages, multiple menus, you need to go where to check the box, it's gonna be all a prompt. Right. That probably even just, you, just, you, you just talk, you don't even type. But we're far, far, far from that, from that uh, stage. And um, in the BI specific, because that's my, my universe, uh, in the BI specifically, you know, last year, I worked mostly with um, Microsoft and in, in, in Tableau, Microsoft Power BI and Tableau as the, the main AI engines, um, BI engines on the front end. Both of them, they uh, got into the, the whole um, uh, chat GPT new wave of, of AI. In both, they came up last year with um, explanations of how this new AI would make uh, business intelligence better. And, and now we have already releases that you can actually see the actual uh, production version of what was announced last year. Uh, the current version of business intelligence AI from those both vendors that I'm aware of primarily is when you ask a question to the computer, if the computer got the answer right, which is today, I don't know what the number, but it's, you know, there's still some work to do, but if the compu computer got the, the question right, and if, you, and if you ask the question right as well, and we'll talk about that in a minute, primarily it's amazing that, you know, it will give you the answer to the question, which this part of the technology, the prior AI was already doing it, but then it give you, gives you multiple slices of this question. For instance, if you ask something very silly, I'm gonna say, show me my top customers by sales in the last quarter. Simple mm -hmm. question, right? Usually the answer is perfect. Boom, you got the answer, assuming the data is clean. In the past, you just get the answer. Today is gonna to show among the 10 customers, these five are growing, these five are declining. This one was buying a lot of this product, now is, is no longer buying. So it's giving you, uh, among the subset of your question, um, answers that most likely you'd be asking next if you knew that those issues were happening. So it's automating questions derived from the first question. In, in this ability, it's amazing because too many times people ask a question and they stop at that answer mm. and they don't peel the onion to see, is there something more important happening be behind this, this, this answer? And this lay, uh, wave of AI is gonna bring or uncover those trends without people asking the question. So it's amazing as this wave improves how much better decisions are gonna be made because AI is gonna be automating those questions. A limitation of this wave of, the, of, of AI in BI is this generation is not yet, quest, not yet questioning the question. And to me, this is a, a, a dilemma that I saw 10 years ago when the first AI came to BI. And I was super excited, you know, finally a interface that any business user that speaks English, right, at least in English, right. will be able to use BI. And quickly I learned that was not the right answer because Quite often when a decision maker asks for a new insight, the first question usually doesn't have the context of what they're thinking. And as a you know, data geek that I am, usually I have to ask, why you wanna ask this question? And then you have to kind of you know, keep on peeling the onion until you understand exactly what the person meant, which was usually five questions deep. And then you can come back and come back with an answer. So until AI evolves to a point where it can question the question, uh, I think the, this AI, AI generation will be more productive for people who are more data geek in the sense that they can understand the problem and ask the computer a right set of questions and the computer takes a different angle. No, 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 it's the other angle and, and correct the answer. So I think this wave of AI is going to be, for BI, is going to be more productive for, more um, helpful for business analysts and not yet for many decision makers because of that um, limitation. Yeah, and riffing on that a little bit, I th if we go along with what you're saying there, I think the business analysts are essentially gonna take on some of the characteristics of what we've called prompt engineers, but they're gonna become, they're gonna help engineer and tune the prompts and help, I think, liaison with domain experts 
to to learn how to ask the right questions of the system right. and and perhaps teach them or be an interface for that and maybe even tune the prompts a little bit on the back end at times. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because the thing I think is somewhat exciting about this is while it to your point it's not the same as a business user getting everything right away for themselves. What it does is it eliminates a little more of the IT bottleneck because it's not as heavy lifting. And also from a data science perspective, it's not as important to invest in massive right. data science teams in order right. to accomplish this. So I think in the in the market that we're talking about with Intact, for example, a lot of these customers don't have big data science teams, right. but they want to get in on some of what is happening here. And to me, you can tell me if you agree, but I do think that even though there are some limitations like you described, it will potentially help get BI in the hands of more right. domain experts who can yeah. use those tools. So. And, and there are, you know, I'm, 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 I'm focusing more on, on the, the limitations, but there are already many, you know, a lot of the um, old school management is retiring, right? right? And there's a lot more kind of, you know, a new wave of management. They're more data driven. They're more technology savvy. And for them, um, all of these AI um, limitations, not really limitation, is it, they, learn, they learn how to use the tools. Right. So um, uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic with the possibilities. Uh, I think um, uh, the amount of uh, uh, data problems that are out there is, is so great right now that AI is gonna help automate something that otherwise, you know, when I think about my team, the amount of effort that today we, we work in, in, in tasks that can be automated, right. it's huge. So if I think five years from now, the same amount of people that today we can help, let's say 100 companies uh, in live projects, probably with the same people, we're gonna be able to help a thousand because a lot of these mechanical things that today we have to know a bunch of you know, boring clicks, 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 the AI is gonna fix those. And then we have to focus on things that AI will not gonna solve, which is really in intelligence. Right, exactly. And, and the, the sort of the deep intelligence is not part of this generation of AI, but it is interesting when you look ahead to Intact's roadmap, because like, I'll be interested to talk to you in a year or two about this when the co-pilot's more read readily available, because it seems to be a pretty sophisticated offering they have planned that would include a fair amount of proactive prompting of individual users around, hey, you know, did you, are you aware that this issue is coming up with this customer or right. are you, and this kind yes. of thing could be interesting for you in terms of some of your adoption struggles, because it's another way of, of pulling users back into the data conversation, right? Yes. Um, so if it can do that, even if it's not always a hundred percent right, every time it pings you, it's at least pulling you into something relevant for exceptions. you. The exceptions, you know, yeah. And that could be, I think, really useful. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to revisit that. Yeah. It, it, and one thing that to me is, it's, it's interesting what's going to unfold is AI is going to, uh, address a lot of, you know, today there are a lot of problems that you have to have specialists in different, you know, pieces of the problem to actually make things work, but AI is going to eliminate a lot of these different buckets. And sometimes I think, you know, for instance, um, how much AI is going to make BI less valuable? Mm. We don't know the answer to this question. We have to see what's going to happen. Right. Uh, we've been following, like you know, Microsoft Azure BI stack, and they have a a, a lot of uh, investment into multiple different experimentation. You know, Microsoft they, they throw a lot of things on the wall. Right. Let's see what sticks. Okay, this one's sick. Let's invest on it. And and on the BI front, you know, just the amount of tools that they are linking and experimenting is overwhelming. Uh, and in my um, specialty, you know, is data warehousing. There's a lot of value in data warehousing. And one of the things that to me, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the Microsoft, uh, you know, um, direction that particular part of the, the BI problem is, uh, they, they were calling Azure's, uh, uh, SQL data warehouse was one of their products that evolved, you know, they change names all the time. And in the latest generation, they call, they call it, um, dedicated SQL pools. So they removed the, the name data warehouse, which has been around for mm. 30, 40 years. And, and I still don't know exactly why they removed it. You know, the question is, do they believe that maybe the data warehouse as a concept is going to become obsolete mm. as this whole AI and new things is going to unfold? 
or not. So right. there's a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems that AI is going to solve, and a lot of uncertainties how things are going to change. Uh, my vision in data self is uh, we've been doing this for a long, long time in this market. I think we understand a lot of business problems that are not necessarily technology. And my goal is to be a, um, not ahead of the curve because too many times the curve doesn't go, it just mm. sizzle. So I, I'm always one, two steps behind, you know, which technology is gonna, is gonna stick. But to me is with this, you know, one, two steps behind the latest and greatest bleeding technology, where technology, or when people bleed, uh, we want to be sure that, you know, with all the expertise we have built over technology and people's problems, how to bring AI in a way that will help BI problems become more automated. Right. And I think that notion of how, whether that sort of federated data versus centralized data locations is going to be an interesting topic. And I don't think we fully know how that's going to play out yet, gonna fold, yeah. but it is interesting how these centralized data warehouse concepts are also challenged by the fact that you're going to want to do a bunch of AI on, I'm holding my phone right now, you're going to want to run a bunch of algorithms on what's going on with my device right. and, you know, and that's not centralized data. Right. So it's going to be right. really interesting to see how that all plays out. I want to cover one more topic before we finish up, which is uh, the back end, because one of the key components in my research on enterprise AI is that for the most part, data quality and data governance structures are going to be very important to the caliber of results that you get. It's not the only ingredient, but it's very important. And almost every enterprise AI vendor is talking about infusing customer specific data into AI results. And it's understandable why they want to do that. Aaron Harris talks a ton about reducing hallucinations, and I, I'm going to be writing about some of their tactics, which are patent pending for how they do that. But the bottom line is that these big consumer models are just not accurate enough, and they're quote unquote too dangerous, I guess you could say, for the, the risk profile of the average company. There was a headline just today about GPT putting out some bad medical advice. Um, so, you know, right. Um, right. actually, I think it was. Um, it wasn't GPT, but it was a similar ilk. Um, I'll remember the name in a sec, but the point is, it doesn't really matter. The point is right. these large language models in the consumer facing side are fraught with these kinds of problems. So we come back, if it's data quality, then now we're back to the dirty little word of ETL right. and all mm -hmm. the stuff that we have to do on the back end historically in the BI world. Yep. And one thing I find fascinating is the question of how can how much and to what extent can AI help us with that? Because, you know, can AI improve the data quality experience of automating some of those steps? And I don't know yet all the answers. I, my early sense is that it can help somewhat, but it's not anywhere near a cure-all because it doesn't necessarily understand the context of an individual company and how they think about certain data structures and certain tags and stuff like that. But yep. I'm curious to your yep. opinion on that. Yeah, I've been uh, putting um, among my, you know, my my AI uh, personal investment. I'm of course um, invested time in the front end because it's the most developed, and there's a bunch of people doing it, and we're going to be just leveraged there. It's like you know, power behind Tableau. But I've been thinking how AI can be used on the back end, which is my, you know, my world is ETL, and I've been thinking conceptually uh, what we do today as humans, you know, data geeks, to solve those problems. In how will eventually AI uh, automate things that today only humans can do? And, and you write that, um, I always tell people that data problems, most, a lot of data problems are not simple, period. It's just not simple and, and it's usually you need people that know a lot of stuff, and know, know the business, know the databases, know the processes, know how people use it, full circle, and then to solve the problem. It's, it's data quality issues, data mapping issues. Uh, uh, you, once you define a problem, when you start to execute and they change the system, now when you start executing, they realize that uh, some assumptions are no longer there. The world is changing too fast. So, so to me, um, when I think about all these problems and I think about AI, uh, and I look specifically in my team, we are 35 people, we're about 20 something data geeks. Um, there's only a few of us, we call the Yoda team, uh, that we can actually navigate all of the, the layers, you know, from the from the mm. data source to the ETL to the data warehouse to the Tableau Power BI 
to build things, to onboard people. We can go all the stack, right? Only a few of us. And then the rest of our team usually are good. They know something really well, kind of a well, you know, they know this or they know that. And if you need to put them together, they have a lot of discussions. And then when I think about AI being a component that can help this whole group of amazing data geeks, uh, my belief is uh, a lot of the more mechanical problems that are associated with um, data pipelines in ETL, I think AI will take like, you know, I don't know, 70% of the work and just do a bunch of things, right? Just do a bunch of things. We don't know exactly how, but my God, you know, we found the customer table here with the customer table there and link them together. Right. And it's just looking at the data, not looking at the tables. Just, yeah. it's the same custom companies. They must be the same companies. Right. They are, right? Today, we, we need a human to do that. Right. Only a human can actually, looking at the metadata, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So I think AI will be able to automate a lot of the process and then again, like even um, Aaron Harris mentioned, humans, humans will continue to be accountable because right. machines, either they get it right automatically or they screw it up really bad. And if you don't have humans that really know what's happening, uh, you're going to have bad processes. Yeah. So when I look at, you know, the future, when AI can deliver a lot of these visions, my, my perspective is in my team that today we have only a few Yoda, we're going to have a bunch of Yodas because mm -hmm. all the kind of mechanical thing that today we have to have the individuals to do those mechanical things. Otherwise, we cannot do Yoda. Eventually, when I get those mm -hmm. non-Yoda people to actually let the machine do the mechanical part and let, make them be more sophisticated to analyze the top end. So my vision is as AI will remove the mechanical, boring, mm -hmm. sucky things that must be done. And then we're going to be able to teach people to be really good at what people are, which is understanding things the machine will never understand. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. That makes a lot of sense to me. I had a very interesting back and forth with Aaron Harris about this during our interview because um, Aaron pushed back a little bit to some extent because he talks about this AI factory concept, which is not a product I should emphasize, but it's some, it's some technology that Sage has developed around its Sage network. But basically, it allows for to build individual models for each customer and he says that they don't need you know incredibly clean data landscapes in order to 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 get set up which really impressed me because i don't hear that very often and he's talking about including customers on older sage releases that have heavily customized their code base and and changed up some of their data models and or even intact customers that have like really configured a lot of dimensions and have a complex you know configuration and he and i, I find it very interesting because i i in my view, I need to hear more about that and hear more from customer projects. So I'll look forward to that. But it's a fascinating concept as far as, you know, not having to clean things as thoroughly. But one of the things he said is that his data science team really likes working with finance data because it does have an underlying structure, which right. a lot of data does not. So that's right. part of the reason I think why it's still workable. Right. And of course, it does open up questions as far as companies that have other data structures beyond intact, which we kind of right. spoke to earlier and stuff right. like that. I personally think the answer is going to be kind of a combination. I, I don't know how it's going to play out, but I think technology like Harris is describing that lets customers off the hook a little bit on, on, on pure data quality would be nice. I think AI cleansing tools are going to be important. And I think they're all going to need adult supervision as well. Yeah. So I, I, my, my, and I, I don't know specifically know what you guys were talking about, but uh, my own learning of AI for data cleaning. Um, over the years, the data cleaning tools we have today, they are a lot more sophisticated than, you know, in the past. Um, and, and to me, there's still a lot of room for uh, an AI to go into a database. And, and, and I'm going to use an example that today is already solved, but to me, there's probably relationships we can do with AI. You know, in the past, if you were to look at a, at a, at a database that has geography information, you know, US, USA, U dot, SA were all different. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, most proper BI tools, they really can realize yep. variations or misspelling of, um, of uh, you know, of, um, of those things. It can automatically fix it. Uh, using this idea, I believe, for an AI machine that can see patterns across lots of data, 
uh, they'll be able to do some data cleaning without humans intervention. So the first path, the machine shows a bunch of things what they has cleaned. You know, you had this, I chose from to this, do you agree? Then you can quickly, you know, many times the b- bad data is misspelling, mm-hmm. right? Or people put an extra space somewhere. Very silly problems that, you know, an AI engine can quickly uh, find, the, find the, the analogies. Of course, there's the more complicated ones. Let's say if you have a cert- some type of categorization in the past, and now you have a different categorization, it might look the same, but they're not. And AI is going to think it's the same and it's going to screw the, the, the categorization. Mm. Uh, so I think AI is going to, again, you know, it's going to be automating things that um, are mechanical. And things that are not mechanical, humans will have to continue to be there to fix the machines. Well, Johnny, we're about to lose the room, so we're out of time. I think there's more we can talk about in the future in terms of how to get that self-service BI into reality. Yeah. I'd love to talk with you more about business users and automation because I may be a little more bullish on their interest in automation than you are, but I think we've mm-hmm. covered enough for today. We're going to leave it there. Thanks for your time. My, my Appreciate pleasure. it. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>